Welcome, guys, back to the Grateful Living Podcast. Today, I'm thankful to have Chris Heron here. Chris Heron is a former professional basketball player and a voice on the topic of substance abuse, substance use prevention, and a wellness advocate. Since 2009, Chris has spoken to over 1 million students, athletes, and community members. Chris is also an author and has founded three organizations that provide programs and services with the goal of overcoming setbacks and navigating life's challenges. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Of course. Thankful to have you on. Um, so for, you know, uh, the small gr um, group of people that, that doesn't know you, you know, uh, if you can just take us back to the beginning of uh, where you grew up, your family situation and, and what type of kid you were. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Florida, Massachusetts, um, family of four, uh, blue collar city, um, parents were young parents. Um, I have an older brother. Um, my parents were just out of high school when they had him. And so we kind of grew up together. Um, you know, my father. Uh, became a politician when I was going through middle school, high school. And um, around that same time, I realized, and, and I think my mom um, realized how much of a drinking problem my father had, how, how much his alcoholism was affecting, you know, their marriage. And then kind of um, sprinkling into our family, uh, you know, all the while I was, you know, one of the best basketball players in the country at that time. And, you know, I was kind of juggling a very dysfunctional home as well as um, playing basketball at, a, at an extremely high level. Um, you know, at 18 years old, I was a McDonald's All-American. I was recruited by all the schools in the country. Um, but at 18 years old, my mom and dad finally got a divorce because of alcoholism and that played a big part of my decision. I decided to go to Boston College um, because I wanted to stay close to my parents. I wanted, you know, to be there through their hard time and kind of support them and and maybe uplift them, um, being that they could they could watch me play college basketball. But um, you know, that experiment was short lived. Um, I was kicked out of Boston College for cocaine use, and it became very evident. Um, at that time in my life that, you know, there's, there's a strong chance that, that I have, uh, substance use and, and, uh, substance misuse and, you know, getting kicked out of Boston college at 18 years old. Um, it immediately put a label on me. Um, you know, in 1994, substance use, drug use, it was complete low completely looked at differently. Um, you know, the optics were different. The narrative was different. Um, you know, I was considered kind of, you know, a has been a loser. Um, and, you know, at 18 years old, that's, that's a tough identity to manage and, and process, uh, you know, but, you know, there were people out there that felt that I was worth a second chance and I got another opportunity to play college basketball. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so, you know, I guess to digest some of that um, first, you know, and obviously this comes with the hindsight of all the knowledge that you have today, but there's a kid that's going to be listening to this growing up with an alcoholic parent, um, mm -hmm. just like you, as you look back, is there, any advice and, uh, that you would give? I, I don't know if it's even fair to ask this, but like, is there any advice you would have, you would have told yourself at, you know, 14 or is there any advice you would give to, you know, a middle school kid that is seeing an alcoholic parent on? Yeah. Uh, I mean, listen, it's, it's, you know, and I do it every day. Right. So, so tomorrow, I mean, I'm currently in, in Idaho and I'll, have a big audience of, of, of teenagers tomorrow. Um, you know, and they're not alone, right? I mean, 2022 alcoholism, uh, it's not a secret anymore. 
you know, our children are, are pretty educated and aware enough to know that, you know, a parent's struggling. And thankfully, you know, because the work that's been done over the last 10, 15 years, the stigma has somewhat been lifted where kids feel comfortable enough to talk about it. Um, you know, it's not their fault, you know, and, and, you know, no kid would ever volunteer to come into this world and live with alcoholics. You know, it, it's not something that, you know, that they, uh, they signed up for. And, you know, that there's plenty of people out there that, you know, unfortunately, you know, when you are connected to this illness, um, when you're connected, you want to protect, you want to keep secret and internalize and keep, keep boundaries within the family. Um, but that's probably the unhealthiest thing you can do. You know, um, there's a lot of power and strength and struggle and, you know, you need a team to join this, this battle with you. And, you know, if, if I was 14 years old, I wish, I wish I had the courage, the knowledge um, to grab somebody and say, this is who I am. I'm not who I pretend to be. And neither is my family. Yeah. You know, I, I read, you know, later on, um, maybe in your, you know, at Fresno when you um, had that 28 day uh, rehab stint in Utah, you know, that you and your parents had a therapy session and mm -hmm. um, later on in his life, your father felt guilt um, towards, you know, the effect that that, you know, that whole um, process had on on you and your brother. I I'm curious uh, on the flip side is if a parent is listening to this and is an alcoholic you know, I'm not sure what type of conversations you have with your father, but is it, you know, does, did he wish he were, you know, more humble and entered AA or, you know, is, is, what would you say to the parent in that situation? You know, alcohol, alcohol is an unbelievably difficult drug um, to treat. Uh, you know, the climate today, the headlines are all about opiates, you know, fentanyl, carfentanyl, heroin, um, Percocets, the pills that are pressed and what's in them. And, and that stuff is all relevant, right? And thankfully we, you know, in 2022, you know, newspapers and, and, and media outlets aren't afraid to discuss it. Um, but the reality to, you know, this, this country when it pertains to substance use, 75% of the people are seeking help for alcoholism. You know, on a national average, it's seven out of 10 out of, in treatment centers, you know, are there because alcohol, you know, had, had brought them to their knees, um, have caused some type of unmanageability um, in, in their life or in their house. Uh, you know, alcohol, my father is 70. Um, you know, he's been to probably five or six detoxes. Um, you know, it's tough. It's tough to convince, you know, someone in their 60s and 70s that, you know, when you're sitting home alone to stay sober. Um, you know, currently at Heron Wellness, you know, we, we have a 74 year old there. Um, and he's an extremely successful man and someone who I care deeply about um, because he has the courage at 74 years old um, to try to kind of rewrite his ending. Um, but, but talking with him, you know, his biggest struggle, um, one, of, one of his biggest struggles are loneliness. You know, um, just no one there, no one to spend time with, no one to share their life with. And my father's very similar to that. Um, you know, I applaud, I commend, I, I adore anybody, you know, from 55 on who, 
who wants to fight for recovery. 100%. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously you mentioned the divorce in, in that introduction. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you write in the book a lot about, you know, just reflecting on, um, you know, the, you know, the alcohol and, and, and the drugs you did in middle and high school and how that might have been, um, you know, kind of the reason because you wanted to feel numb or you wanted to escape or you didn't want it. You wanted to get away. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, do you have any advice to kids going um, through that process of their parents getting divorced um, as you look back on your own experience? You know, again, it's not their fault, right? I and mean, it's not their responsibility to make it right. You know, I think I think as children, you know, we think because we're part of that family that we have a duty um, and a responsibility to make our family stronger and happier and healthier. Um, you know, that's really not possible when parents are struggling at that level. Um, you know, I, I again, you know, divorce too in 1994 was kind of taboo topic. You know, nobody really wanted to talk about it. Um, and the reality is my mom stayed way too long because of the stigma attached to it. Uh, yeah. You know, she deserved to live a better life. She deserved different love in her life. Um, and she she deserved to, to live with someone, you know, who validated her and who, who appreciated her. Um, you know, my father is, you know, he's an unbelievable guy. Um, you know, when I was at my lowest points in life, he was one of the people that were there, one of the few. Um, but I will not sit back and say that his alcohol, his alcoholism didn't have a unbelievably negative impact on our lives. Um, you know, again, I think when it comes to addiction, um, mental health, I think we focus so much on the worst day. I think we forget how this begins. I I think we forget the first day. Uh, Our children's first days are very relevant. And if we're willing to ask the tough questions, we might get what we need to to support them and, and to help them through it. Um, so I encourage anyone who's struggling at any level to have people in their life that, that aren't afraid to ask tough questions. Yeah. And, um, you know, for anybody out there, um, Chris came out with a film called, uh, first day to absolutely an amazing film. Um, definitely check it out. Um, the, the other thing, Chris, that's, that's very, um, marked in your your childhood is Mm -hmm. is basketball and you talk about that pressure you know from from 14 you were a known commodity in the state um you as you said eventually became a mcdonald's all-american was featured on sports illustrated you know when you were at boston college um you know as you look back on that process and Maybe there's a basketball player that's in middle school today um, going through that press and and all that. Um, Is is there anything you would say to your yourself back then? You know, I wish I had somebody in my life and I, and it's, and please, I don't want anyone to interpret this as blame because I think, the people who I had in my life um, were not in a position um, to kind of look past their struggle. Uh, but I just wish I had somebody in my life who, who grabbed me at 14, 15, 16 and said, you know, like you are an unbelievable basketball player. Um, I don't know how you do it, but you perform at a very high level in front of thousands of people. Um, and the amount of pressure and stress that you have to take on and manage during those moments are pretty impressive. But that being said, I would love to understand why on a Friday night, 
you know, and, and the lights go out and the thousands of people go home, that you really struggle internally with being you amongst kids that you've known since you were five years old. And kids, I wish I, but I believe kids need to be challenged socially. Um, you know, it, it requires coaching. It requires practice. It requires mentorship. Um, and, you know, I didn't have that in my life at that time. Um, I was often encouraged to be, you know, a beast on the basketball court. Um, I wasn't encouraged to be a beast emotionally and socially. And I think, I think as a culture, we've surrendered to the fact that kids will be kids and they're going to, they're going to experiment. Um, and that's what high school kids do. They drink and, and smoke pot. The sad thing about that is I've never met a parent who had that same approach, whose child later in life became an addict. They would love to hit rewind, go back and, and take that, that mantra, that belief out of their system and not say a kid will be kid, all kids do it. Yeah, this is an interesting topic because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious um, what your thoughts are. You know, uh, as I read your your book um, mm -hmm. and listened to your talks, I, I totally get what you're where you're coming from. But at the same time, it's it's interesting because, you know, it's very ingrained in our culture, as you talk about, to you know, try weed or alcohol, you know, in middle school and, you know, to drink at sweet 16s and things like that. What, like, how do you, and, and obviously now you're, you know, you're a father, um, you know, how do you look at, or in a perfect world, how, how do, how should middle and high school kids look at that time period and, you know, are you against all drug consumption or what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. 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 I'm not, I, listen, the, you know, way past beyond me is this science that proves that the frontal lobe of our children's brains are very undeveloped in their teenage years. And if they can abstain during those teenage years, um, and kind of hold out to the drinking age, 21, uh, that the frontal lobe of their brain would be fully developed and that their chances of struggling with alcoholism or drug addiction drop drastically. So am I against 16 year olds um, getting wasted on the weekends? Yes, 100%. Am I against 17 year olds getting money from their mom and buying drugs off a drug dealer so they can get high. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely against that. Um, you know, I, I think what's, what's relevant is when I talk to kids, right, who, who, are, who are going through this, um, nothing hits high school kids harder in my presentation than when I refer to their little brother and sister doing what they're doing. And when I, when I have them sit in that presentation and I, I have them think for a minute of the kid that they've become up to that point and now bring their little brother and sister in it and imagine them finding out what their big brother or big sister is up to, um, that hits different. And, but because teenagers were so self-absorbed and, and, you know, we're not thinking of others. Um, but, but when a teenager thinks of their little sister, you know, hiding, keeping secrets from their mom and dad, cutting, self-harm, being bullied, going out, getting wasted, engaging in, you know, risky, at-risk behavior, um, it doesn't feel so good for them. And, and that's why I believe that, you know, 
this is, you know, my conversation with kids is not just about drugs or alcohol. It's about family. It's about self-esteem. It's about self-worth. And I think if we can really drive that and make them take a look at themselves, you know, they might make different decisions. Chris, you know, obviously I don't believe this, but I think mm. there might be someone out there that listens to that and wants to challenge you. Right. Yeah. And they're going to say, you know, Chris, it's impossible for a middle or high school kid to, you know, you know, when they're out on a Friday or Saturday night to, to reject, you know, alcohol, weed or cocaine, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, to that person or to that kid that's feeling like there's a lot of peer pressure or things like that mm -hmm. nature. I mean, wh what is your recommend? Is it to just maybe. flat out reject it or yeah, what do you I mean, think? Maybe they need different friends. You know what I mean? So yeah. you know, no parent can tell me that because it's not true. Right. If, if there's an adult out there, an educated adult that thinks that 100% of all teenagers get drunk and high on weekends, you know, that, that, that's, that's, unfortunately, it's not true. There's a lot of kids that can go out on weekends and manage. There's a lot of kids out there that abstain. There's a lot of kids out there that party, dance, have fun without it. I know that because I have two children myself that have gone through the process. So my son, Christopher is 22 and my daughter, Samantha is 20. Neither one have tasted alcohol or done drugs. They've both gone through middle school, high school and college without substances. And, you know, nothing makes me happier than when I see my daughter out with her friends at Providence College on a Saturday night, dancing, having fun, smiling. And I know she has no alcohol or drugs in her system. And what's really amazing is at that age, she's a sophomore at Providence. Her friends are absolutely um, blown away by it. They're just blown away that she can do what they do without it. So it's not an argument, right? Because it's, it's not factual. Um, I'm, again, I'm more, I'm more looking at it this way, Chris, it, yeah. like for you, I mean, maybe you had this conversation with your son, but like, mm -hmm. you know, especially, you know, in an environment with alpha males, like, um, on a basketball team on a Friday yeah. night, you know, how is it that you're, you know, your son played, you know, two years at Boston college. Now he's at mm -hmm. Alabama, but, mm -hmm. but like, you know, he, he's, he's an athlete. Um, how, how was it that he rejected or how, how did he present when he was in those situations? I just how think it was, a, I think it was a hard pass. Right. I mean, and, and again, he can speak to it better than I do. Right. But, but just listening to my children, my son and my daughter would say the hardest times of their life when it pertained to abstaining passing was between the age of 14 and 16. The, that was the window that they felt the most pressure to go out with their friends and have a couple of drinks, smoke a little. Once my daughter said, once I hit my junior, senior year, I found my kind of track and I was okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, both of them have been in drinking cultures currently you know, BC, Providence College, um, University of Alabama, um, they've been around a ton of, of alcohol, a ton of partying, and they currently have friends that party. Um, but they, they just don't. And that's a, that it's a beautiful thing. And, and I didn't have that, that in me. Uh, I didn't have that ability. Um, but I'll tell you this, because to the parents who say, um, you know, all kids do it and, you know, they have to, ex they have to experience it in my treatment center at, at Heron Wellness. I have 36 people living there right now. So the one in Massachusetts has 36 people. 
in that center right now between the age of 16 and 74 currently. Average age is around 28 to 32. Again, most people are being treated for alcoholism, but we have people who struggle with crystal meth, cocaine, Adderall, Xanax, you name it, we have it. Mm -hmm. The scariest thing for me as a professional, as the owner, as a father of the kids that are in my center right now suffering from a marijuana psychosis, it is not even close how frightened, how frightening it is when you see this beautiful little boy who has a 4.0 at University of Miami and the only drug he's ever done in his life has smoked and his life is completely unraveled and his mental state is so, so, so compromised. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, Chris, it, there's a, a point you make in, in the first day film um, about if parents find out that their kids are drinking or smoking, mm -hmm. what questions to ask. Can you, can you talk about that? Well, I think, you know, and, and I'll, I often do community events and parents, you know, adults will email me on this. And I use my, my reference point is my parents. Um, you know, when parents catch their kids, either drunk for the first time, drinking, smoking weed, whatever it is. Usually the conversation, they want to know who they were with, where they got it, how much they did, and what were they doing. They don't ask why. And it's amazing how many parents out there will email me and say, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, that when I caught my 14, 15 year old daughter, I never even asked her why she did it. I was so concerned about the ex exterior of this. Um, you know, whose house was it in? How much did you do? Where did you get it? Who bought it for you? And, and the why is left out. And I think the why is the, really the only, which should be the first thing we understand about our children. Um, because as I said, as, as I say to kids, um, I'll be in front of say a thousand kids tomorrow. And I'm going to tell those kids five years ago, six years ago, you begged the family member who you loved to quit smoking. As a child, you would hide cigarettes. You would beg them to put them out. You'd break cigarettes. You'd cry over cigarettes. Those same kids just five years later, are sucking on a piece of metal. But because we have created this image, smokers have holes in their throats. Drug addicts are homeless and have no teeth. But because we've done such a poor job at the, 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 the overall picture and the progression, kids don't identify as as that person who, who currently is struggling, right? Sucking on a piece of metal, that's what kids will do. The reality is, you know, they're now, every kid in there, the ones who are currently vaping, little kids look at them and feel bad for them. And they need to know that. And, and, and unfortunately, I don't think they're told that enough. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously people can research your history, but you went to Boston College, um, got into a situation um, where you failed a drug test and um, things like that, ended up at Fresno State. I'm, I'm curious from your perspective as you look at your journey, um, because you write at Boston College, at least initially, maybe you were only, you know, the cocaine was maybe once a month and you didn't feel yeah. like you were addicted. When, when do you think your real addiction began? Well, I think, I think it was, again, it was pretty evident, right? That when I was, when I was 18 and I was at Boston college and I was, I was part of a basketball team who received an athlete who received a division one scholarship. There was a higher standard. 
and you know we were held to a higher standard than than the students on campus and that standard was to be drug free and at 18 years old i was one of those kids who said it was just weed no big deal until they took it away from me and once i had to be me 24 7 once i had none no relief no coping um I realized how, how profound it was in my life, how much I leaned on that substance to get me through certain points of my life. Um, at 18 years old, I was well aware that I was way too dependent on substances and getting kicked out of Boston College three months, four months into it because of drug use, um, you know, it was a huge red flag, you know, and, and, uh, and honestly, right. And, and to me, and some people won't look at it, they won't peel it, peel their life back enough. Um, but I was a kid who grew up hating Miller lights to the kids in here right now, to the kids who will listen to parents who are listening. I was that kid that wanted to hide him, get him out of the fridge, hated seeing it in my father's hand. Um, I struggled with that beer because of that beer so much as a boy, as a child. And I started drinking that beer as a boy. You know, 14 years old, man, I'm drinking yeah. the beer that completely wiped out my family. Yeah. And that's supposed to be cool. That's supposed to be part of adolescence and childhood. Yeah. So, you know, that was a very relevant point in my life. And then 14, my father's Miller Lights. 18, first two drug tests at BC were for marijuana. The third one was cocaine. And sadly, you know, I fell in love with cocaine because cocaine gave me the ability, sadly, to express myself pretty openly. And people who have done cocaine, they'll be able to identify with that. Um, you know, I found myself at three, four in the morning telling my, spilling my guts and, and talking to strangers about my life. And, and there, was, there was a level of relief there, um, but that should be done obviously you know, from a much healthier, uh, you know, I, sh I, I, I didn't have that ability to, to have those conversations as, as a sober young man. Yeah. What was interesting, um, a little bit of a tangent, but what was interesting reading your book as a basketball fan was you talking about you didn't even love basketball. Mm. And that was, don't. yeah, mm -hmm. which was really, really interesting um, because it really showed, you know, how much you were going through. Um, I I'm curious, do you know when you lost the love of basketball? Um, I'd say probably like fourth, fifth grade. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know, because I, I kind of realized around middle school, sixth grade, that I had a brother who was winning state championships. And um, and I was going to have to follow that. And then all of a sudden I was in eighth grade and I was being recruited by college coaches. Um, so, so, you know, basketball became... Um, it was just... It, it caused quite amount of pressure in my life. And, you know the pressure of following a very successful brother, you know, Massachusetts player of the year, a couple of years in a row, state champion back to back, brought a lot of pride to Fall River, um, to, be a, to be a fifth grader watching that. You know, and every person who I bumped into at those games, you know, would say to me, you know, you're next. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna bring the same thing to us. Um, so once I, kind of took that on 
I stopped really enjoying it. That's interesting. Um, you know, so this, you know, despite all this, you're performing on mm -hmm. the basketball court, um, 33rd pick Denver Nuggets. I, I was curious. So, you know, obviously you were only there one year, but you said that was the healthiest year uh, up to that point in your life. You know, what did they do? And, you know, do you like, was that just a band aid? Or, like, if you think, like, if you weren't traded to Boston, do you think in year two at Denver you would have kept up the healthy lifestyle? No. I was just, I was, I was still untreated, right? Like, I, I, I had so many unresolved, um, situations in my life that, that needed, you know, therapy, some type of care, acknowledgement, um, validation, whatever. But it was, you know, I was untreated. I, I, I walked into a situation where I played for a man who I really respected in Dan Issel. Um, you know, I knew that he gave me a shot that most wouldn't. So I wanted to be good for him. Um, that played a part in my, you know, how I responded that year. But I also had, you know, grown men who I looked up to. Um, you know, I walked into a situation where, you know, Popeye Jones, Bryant Stith, Antonio McDice, Nick Van Exel, Chauncey Billups, um, Corey Alexander, professionals. You know, when you look at my Denver Nuggets roster, most of them are still currently involved in basketball at a professional level. Um, and they were well on that path when they, when I was a rookie. Um, so I had, I had some male figures there that, um, I had a lot of admiration and respect for, which again, I, and I wanted to, to play well and, 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 and be good around. Um, and I think that played a big part in it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, people can l look up your history, but yep. two years in the NBA went, um, overseas and that's really where, you know, a lot of the drug addiction in terms of heroin and, uh, maybe crystal meth and things like that um, really uh, got pretty bad. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, for the value of people listening to this, you know, um, August 1st is your sobriety day, but yeah. there was, you know, a 30 to 40 day period before that um you know where you were you know sober mm -hmm. um and then and then you were you had some time away from day point or day top um i guess how like everybody listening to this that's addicted wants to get to that August 1st, 2008 day for you. Um, for, for them, you know, I guess, what advice do you have? Um, you know, I truly believe this and some people think, um, some people just, they don't, they don't buy in, but, but I think recovery gives you such an advantage in life. Um, recovery has strengthened every facet of my life. It's added value to every facet of my life. Uh, I was 32 years old. I had overdosed four times. Um, I had hepatitis C from intravenous drug use. Um, you know, uh, we wouldn't have a home if it wasn't for family. My wife was on food stamps as a family. Um, and to me, I believed in my heart that I was so far down 
um, that there was no reason to even try to get sober. Um, because I looked at my life and, and I said, if I get sober, what am I going to do? Like, what could I possibly do? You know, I'm 32 years old. I've been overdosing. I have track marks on my arms. You know, I'm not going to go back to school. I'm not going to be successful in any facet of my life. Um, and that was the furthest thing from the truth, right? Like, you know, to open up a wellness center at 10 years sober, to have a foundation that's given away, you know, seven and a half million dollars in scholarships to, you know, 13 and a half years later, I've spoken in front of a couple of million kids and made a couple of documentaries. So, you know, when you make that decision to buy in, to go all in to recovery, you know, whatever you want is there for you. Um, and recovery is going to give you that advantage when you go after it. Um, that being said, I think there's a lot of, I don't know. Sometimes I think we put too much emphasis on dates. Sometimes I think we put too much emphasis in the recovery community around numbers. Um, you know, I love the fact that people celebrate recovery. Um, but I think oftentimes people get so caught up in how many days, how many months, how many years. And when they do struggle, it takes them a while to come back because they believe that they lost so much. Um, and the reality is they struggled for three weeks. Um, and whether you have two years or 20 years, that was three weeks out of, out of your life. And, and, you know, to not focus on the number and what you lost to get back on a healthy track, um, you know, is extremely noble, admirable. Um, but, you know, August 1st, 2008 is my date. Um, you know, we celebrate it as a family. Uh, you know, my recovery, and I, and I want, you know, it's not an ego thing, but, you know, it's the most important day in our house. You know, my children are very well aware of what recovery has given our family. Um, and without it, our family would will struggle. Um, so, you know, August 1st, 2008 is something I'm extremely grateful for. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm blessed to even have a date. Um, but, but we kind of celebrate every day, you know? Um, you know, people once told me when I first got sober that, you know, the pink cloud will disappear, right? And the pink cloud has never disappeared. You know, recovery has, you know, I'm not at a porn shop. I'm not bouncing a check. I'm not scrapping metal. I'm not collecting cans. I'm not smoking cigarettes off the ground. I'm not sharing needles. I'm not drinking dirt cheap vodka. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful world that I live in today, man. It's yeah, something, yeah. you know, it's something that uh, I'm extremely grateful for. And, and anyone out there who's listening, who struggles, um, it's waiting, you know, and there's a lot of people that would love to be part of that with you on that journey. One aspect of this is, you know, during this time period, you were a parent and, um, you know, I think at the time you and Heather had two kids while you were at Daytop, um, even just throughout this journey, I'm, I'm curious, you know, how honest or any recommendation you have for any parents that are going through, um, some sort of, you know, rehabil rehabilitation, you know, how honest or at what age did your kids know, or like how, you know, uh, did you wait till they were 14? When, when did you, or. Uh, no, I sat down and I watched Unguarded with Chris when he was 11. Um, I had to because, you know, their dad and their family story was about to be on national TV. So, you know, one of my requests 
from ESPN and John Hawk, who directed and produced it, was to just please give it to me before it airs on TV so I can, I can sit down with my children and we can watch it together. Um, Sammy was probably nine and Chris was probably 11. And, you know, we cried a lot, you know. Um, you know, but the reality to that is we still cry. Um, you know, it's been 13 and a half years and, and we still cry. I, uh, you know, Christopher's 22 and it's probably the first kind of amends that I had made to him. Um, you know, my whole thing when I first got sober was my kids were going to see the amends. Like it was, it was action. Um, you know, that what their dad was doing was he was working really hard to be that sober dad. Um, but a month ago in my kitchen, um, you know, we started talking and it went in a different direction and, and, you know, I started crying and I, I, I apologized to him. I apologized to him for all those moments that he felt afraid. Um, and it was, it was powerful. So, um, I think it all depends on the kid. It all depends on the family and it all depends on whether or not the parent is really serious about it. You know, my kids didn't want to hear sorry. They wanted to see sorry. Um, so it took me 13 and a half years before I said sorry to Chris. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, for the individual that might be, you know, let's say within the first year, so they're three mm -hmm. months sober or whatever. Was there a point at which you were like, I'm good? Or like, because a lot of them, especially if you're like three months in, you're like, you know, there's so much of my, my identity, you know, that past self of me or whatever is still right there. You know, it was there a point like at, I don't know, six months, one year, two years where you were like, I know I'm good or. Oh, <laughs> I would never jinx myself like that. Right. Yeah. I know yeah. I'm good. Hell yeah. no. Um, yeah. But I had belief in me when I celebrated a year. When I put 365 days together and I hit that year mark, I was like, you know, you're on to something. Like you are putting these days together, man. You know, because, you know, in that first year, there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of regret. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of facing people to make amends and, you know, wanting people now to kind of believe in the new you. Um, and when I hit that year and celebrated, um, I, I just felt like I was onto something. And, and, you know, I felt like, you know, I didn't hit the eject button. Um, I didn't bang off the cost before the finish line. You know, like I, I ran through it 365 days and I was like, I want to, I want to keep going. Um, you know, that being said, there's days I want to, I want to relapse, you know, 13 and a half years sober, there's days I, I, and it's the days that I, you know, it's not that you want to, um, there's just days that I struggle with being me and there's days I wake up, I don't like what I see and, um, you know, there's days that I'm consumed with negativity or fear or anxiety. And then, you know, those feelings of numbing and coping um, kind of cycle back in. Um, those days are very few, um, but there's days that, that I struggle enough where, you know, having a drink or taking a pill or smoking a blunt enters my mind. Have you, have you been even closer than that? Is, is there been? No, have you bought? Never. Okay. No, 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 okay. never. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I've never like had a beer in my hand or, 
sat in the parking lot um, thinking about going in to buy something or driving by my old drug dealers' houses. Um, I've never, I've never been there. Um, you know, but, but, but the reality is right. That's a very small piece of it, right? Like I've had the buildup to get to that point. I was just fortunate enough to have a, a lot of people around me who, who were well-versed and understood and were good at recovery. Um, and I surrounded myself with people that, you know, recovery was extremely relevant on a day-to-day -day basis. And we talked about it a lot. So, you know, when you're hyper-focused on that stuff, like you, you tend to kind of talk it through and, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to talk it through before I've gotten to that point. Yeah. Um, Chris, can you, can you talk about Heather, um, a little bit, just give us her, her flowers. Um, you know, she loved you, um, you know, when you were in, in sixth grade, she loved mm -hmm. you when you were NBA and had money. She loved you, you know, when you guys were broke and had no heat or no TV. Um, you know, you talk in the book, she had pressure from other people to leave you. Mm. Um, can you, can you just talk a little bit about Heather? Yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, when, you know, your mom and your dad and your brother and sister, uh, uh, rightfully so like begging you to just close that chapter and move on. Um, you know, when she's going to bed at night and she's tucking in the kids and, you know, there's no money and, and the struggle is overwhelming. And, you know, Heather's a very smart, smart woman. Um, you know, she was the highest level of, of achievements in college, cum laude and all that kind of stuff. Something I never, a list I was never a part of. Um, but, and, and also, you know, Heather went on to get her master's when, you know, when I was struggling and she was raising kids. Um, so she's a very bright, talented woman. And, uh, you know, to, to, to fight back and to go against the people who love you and say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to see this through. Um, not many people would see that through. And, and she did. And I'm very well aware that every, every memory, every day that I've shared with my children since I got sober is because of her, because she had every right and to meet someone new, to bring someone else into her children, our children's lives, um, you know, another person for them to look up to. Um, and she didn't. And, and I, I'm the father, I'm the husband, I'm the son. Um, I am today because of her. Is, is there anything you would like to say about, you know, Mrs. Reed, Chris mm. Mullen, or the counselor who told you to do your family a favor? Yeah, Mrs. Reed, man, she's, I, she sent me a picture the other day. Um, you know, I didn't know her. She knew me. Um, she knew my family. And, um, you know, she's a nurse that, you know, it was, it was her, her oath um, to help someone struggling. And, and she nursed me. Um, you know, suicide was on my mind and she redirected me. Um, you know, I probably, I don't know where I'd be uh, if Mrs. Reed didn't intervene that day. You know, the Mullins have always been part of my life. Um, you know, Heron Project and the 2,700 families, 2,800 families that we've, we've sent to treatment over the last 10 years is because of the Mullins. 
like, I just remember laying in bed at daytop and, and saying to myself, I want to be not Chris Mullen, the basketball player. Um, I want to be Chris Mullen and Liz Mullen, the people who can pick up the phone and say, Hey, I understand what you're going through. I'm going to help you out. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, the counselors at daytop, I've been back. Um, I've been in contact with them. Uh, actually, you know, one of the counselors who, who was aggressive with me um, when I relapsed, he's, he's been at Jacob Hill um, for my celebrations. So, you know, Larry, Spooner, uh, Colum, um, you know, all the counselors that I was fortunate enough to have early on in my recovery have had great impact. And, you know, you just never know when, you know, I tell people all the time, like I played against Jordan. I don't remember it. I played against Shaq. I have no recollection of it. And not because I'm not because of drugs. Um, you know, I played against Kobe. Um, but Mrs. Reed, I could, I could reenact that time I spent with her. The Mullins, the counselors at Daytop, word for word, I remember, um, you know, their impact on me is something that uh, I'll be forever grateful and it has inspired me to help others, right? That, that's, that's what I've done in the last 13 and a half years is just tried to be them. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, gratitude is a huge part of recovery and, and, you know, without it, I don't think I'd be sober. Um, and, and those people that you just mentioned are not only special to me, but special to every, every person in my family. Yeah, after, after rehab, you know, reintegrating into society, um, is there a piece of advice that comes to mind, um, whether it's, you know, even just as simple as staying consistent with AA meetings or something like that where, you know, cause I, I'm, I'm sure at times you were self-conscious of like, Oh wow, this is like, this is a positive self. I haven't seen <clears throat> in a long time, you know, how, you know, can I keep this up? Yeah. I mean, listen, I think it's important to surround just, I think everybody needs a start in five, you know, like I think everybody needs the, you know, four best, um, players to be part of that team with them. Right. And, you know, and in recovery, they say, you know, find a sponsor and, you know, the sponsor is kind of the captain, um, you know, the veteran. And, but, but I, I surrounded myself. I was very, um, I integrated a lot of my basketball experience, my athletic experience into my recovery. And that was, you know, being part of a great group, practicing with great players, going to great meetings, surrounding myself with all stars. Um, you know, that's who I wanted to be. And that's the people I wanted to be around. Um, and, you know, in the game of basketball, the more you shoot, the better you get at it. Uh, repetition matters, habits matter. And, you know, I, I was habitual, um, in my recovery and, and, you know, I, I got a lot of reps up on a daily basis, whether that's through meetings, phone calls, text messages, service work, um, prayer, you know, it was all, they're all my jump shots. Um, it's, it's, it, you know, my recovery has its own little gym and, and workout program to it. And I've been fortunate enough to stick by it for the last you know, 13 and a half years. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, after all this, you know, you, you talked about unguarded and, um, being a, a speaker and, and things like that. I'm curious, have you conceptualized, you know, maybe this being your purpose that helping, you know, even though it was a tough life, was there a point at which you realize 
maybe this what like this is my life's purpose that you know if i had you know you know you talk about being dead for 30 seconds mm. all of this wouldn't be happening you know the oh, the millions yeah. of people that you are impacting their lives the you know the documentaries the th like has, was there a point at which you were like you embraced this well, speaking aspect listen, yeah, this is something I, this is something I wanted. I want to chase, right? Like I wasn't going to be good at basketball for very much, for very long drugs and no drugs because I didn't want to chase it. Right. It wasn't, I didn't wake up and want that in my life. Um, you know, I wake up and I want this, um, you know, I tell people and, and I got to wrap this up, but I tell people yeah. all the time, I tell people all the time, like, you know, in Major League Baseball, you play 162 games. In the NBA, you play 82. I do 220 speaking events a year. You know, so I do three, you know, three times the amount of games I played in the NBA as far as speaking events. And I love every one of them, man. I love showing up. I love chasing it. I love, you know, just being part of somebody else's recovery or struggle. And... You know, when you wake up and you want to chase something and, and you wake up and, and you want to be your best at something, you know, um, that gives you purpose and, 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 you know, and passion. And, you know, oftentimes on the basketball court, I looked like I was very passionate um, and I was, but there was a lot of fear and anger attached to that passion. Um, here there's a lot of purpose attached to it and, and, and love and, you know, a spirit that, you know, I'm very, very, very grateful to just be one of the many, um, that have an opportunity today to, to serve and to be part of something special. Yeah. Uh, well, Chris, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Um, you know, is, um, if there's any other parting words you'd like to say, feel free to. And if not, um, what's the best way to support you, support um, the mission of, you know, helping people nav navigate life's challenges? Yeah, you know, it's, you know, my, my foundation is an amazing resource. Um, Heron Project, uh, you know, the people that work there um, are unbelievably passionate about helping others. Um, understand addiction, understand recovery, Heron Wellness, um, you know, it's just a, a beautiful place where people kind of reset, um, you know, and we have people there that are there for just mental health and, and, and very little misuse and extreme misuse. Um, you know, and Heron Talks is just the platform where I go around and, and I do a lot of my speaking engagements. So listen, without you, and people like you who, um, who have interest and, um, you know, aren't afraid to talk about it. It's, you know, like I tell people all the time, Simone, Simone Biles, she pulled out of the Olympics, um, you know, because of the work that has been done over the last decade and the conversations that have been had where she felt that it was okay. And, and that, that, that woman, um, you know, that, that move she made is going to impact people for, you know, the next 50 years. And, you know, it's small conversations, it's, it's podcasts, it's speaking events, it's all of it is relevant and all of it matters. And I just want to thank you for having me. Well, Chris, thank you for the kind words. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you, you know, as, as I hope you are able to conceptualize, you know, when you say these stories of like a girl stopping, cutting and, mm -hmm. you know, having the courage to stand up to their classmates, you're changing um, millions of people's lives. And um, so thank you for the work yeah. that you do. No doubt. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Thank you.